Haleluya Wa maisha ya daima Amene na mwenyewe Haleluya Utaishi ukita zamani Ujumbe
Good morning, and praise the Lord. I hope you are familiar now with your neighbor. In Kenya, we have this common way of, you know, turn to your neighbor and is it shake their hands or shake them? Really to welcome every last one of us that is here. Our guests from across the borders have been recognized. The associates of FOCUS, the speakers and various facilitators, the students. I think we didn't recognize the students. Who are the students that are here this morning? Good. Yeah. The church leaders and government officials that could be here, Karibu Sana. I really want to welcome you to this Hesabika National Convention. Allow me to also really appreciate the team that has worked tirelessly to put this program together. I am sure when we started this journey, when they started this journey, the, the, the picture has been forming as we've moved along and really to appreciate our team led by our brother Joshua. We are so blessed that you have responded to the quickening of the Lord in your heart to really lead us in this way through this program. And so let's just put our hands and just appreciate them. Focus is, is really about effective Christian living. And, and as we gather here in the next three days, I think this is really what we would want to keep asking ourselves in the context of what we see, in the reality of the challenges that confront us, how do we as Christians become effective in being salt and light? And as I've thought about this meeting, just want to share with you three quick thoughts that have come to my mind. One of them is really, as we sit here as graduates, as we, as we sit here as business people, civil servants, people from the academia world, to all of us, we can be said that much has been given to us. Much grace, much favor, much training, much preparation, much equipping. And the scripture does challenge us because it asks us and says that to whom much is given, much is expected. Dear brothers and sisters, our country calls, our villages call, the corporate sector calls, the civil society calls, and the call is to you. Much has been given to you. Some of you were the first to go to university from your villages and from your counties and some from your families. Much has been given to you. Dear friends, much is expected. But the second thought that has come from my mind has been the question of how do we respond to this call? And it is one where we have to confront the reality of the price that has to be paid. We all feel the concern, we all feel sometimes even some anger. We oftentimes get annoyed and we feel unhappy. But are we prepared to pay the price, to count the cost of effecting the change that we so much desire? It feels to me like many of us would want some change to come from somewhere. But we're perhaps not prepared to pay the price. And so as the Lord quickens us, as he speaks to us, as he challenges us, we need to confront this issue of paying the price to bring about the change that we so desire. And finally, is to encourage us today that God is a beginner and perfecter of this work. And you might feel overwhelmed as you think about the challenge that perhaps confronts us in the corporate sector, in the churches, in the enterprise Kenya, in all these spheres. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed. 
But I want to encourage you that this is the Lord at work. And all we have to do is yield ourselves to him. The beauty is that God does work through people. And as we are here over this time, take time to network, to interact, to learn from each other, to build these sort of networks that we so much need for the journey ahead. As I sit down, let me say, let us get Hesabika trending. All of us that are here and are on social media, social media now has become a very, very strong voice. I want to ask you, please, over the sessions, let us get Hesabika trending. Let Kenya know that something is happening. Let Kenya know that something is being birthed. Something is being formed. Please, would you really, um, you know, use your means to get this voice and this word out there? And so let us take these next few days to allow the Lord to quicken us and to lead us. And on behalf of the leadership in focus, the advisory committee, the National Governing Council, the trustees, the staff, everyone, karibu sana, and God bless you. Thank you so much, Ken. And uh, we do want to reiterate that um, if you are on social media, and a good number of you here should be, please help us to get Hesabika to trend. Um, I think it's hashtag Hesabika, or at least hashtag stand up and be counted. Um, Amen. We are going to find out if we do have um, wireless facilities here. Uh, and as soon as we do, <clears throat> we'll let you know so that you can, uh, you can sign on as well. But uh, allow us to please now welcome to give welcome remarks the chairman of Hesabika, good friend, Dr. Joshua Wathanga, to come and give his welcome remarks as well. Let's welcome Joshua. Bwana asifiwe sana. Praise be to God. Good to see all of you. You had us scared because at 8 o'clock there were more speakers than the rest of you. <laughs> so welcome, welcome. And uh, um, actually we were going to have um, uh, several speakers to, to each of you in the workshops. Uh, and uh, so we are happy that you are here so that we can get started. Karibu sana. Um, so I actually want to start from there, thanking particularly our speakers for uh, coming on time, for uh, being the first to Hesabika in that way. And I think as Kenyans, uh, there, there are some reasons why it's difficult to, to come on time. But I think we need to Hesabika there. Don't you agree? <laughs> Absolutely. Now, how many of you promise that tomorrow we are not going to have that situation where we have got more speakers than the rest of us? How many of you? I think I want to thank you for that. Let's try that tomorrow. But I think there is also another way that our speakers and some of them, um, uh, if I, we tell you that uh, the kind of things that they have done to get here and to prepare for you, uh, you would be convinced if you are not that, uh, that God is here and that God wants to do a mighty work uh, amongst us. Uh, one of them uh, got to uh, just see the clip that uh, many of us uh, watched and uh, looked at the website and uh, uh, just thought, hey, God is asking me to write something about this convention. So there's a booklet that you have received or you will receive that was out of the inspiration uh, by one of the speakers uh, to write on a Hesabika startup and be counted. Now you get uh, to, to know who that is uh, when you look at that booklet, but let us thank uh, that speaker for doing that and we are going to acknowledge him later. 
So I'd mentioned that I think the first area that we need to have a beaker on is uh, keeping time, but uh, there are many areas that we need to do that. Maybe even the way we build our roads, the way we handle our drainage, uh, you are in the right place because these are the things that we should be talking about. How can we make a difference in each of these areas? Let me share a concern uh, before I say everything else, that uh, it's not been an easy convention to mobilize for. You would think that uh, with all uh, the publicity, uh, both uh, directly to uh, many focus associates and also in the media, that this would be an easy convention to mobilize for. In fact, the reason why we brought it to Nairobi and made it a day convention is to make it possible and easy for particularly Nairobi people because that's where we've got the majority of associates to be able to come here. And we also try to look for sponsorship and we are very grateful for uh, many of you who are here representing the organizations that have supported us financially to subsidize uh, so massively uh, to make it possible as much as it is uh, to have uh, as many people as possible. But even with that, we cannot fill this, this hall, apparently. And uh, so, why not? And last night, in um, a three-hour traffic jam, uh, a distance that would normally take uh, about uh, 25 minutes or so, we had plenty of time to discuss with uh, one of the forecast directors. And we were uh, asking ourselves, why has it been so difficult to uh, mobilize for Hesabika? Now, there are many reasons, and uh, there are uh, changes and um, improvements that uh, Hesabika and Focus uh, should make and should learn out of uh, this experience. But there was something else that uh, he said, that uh, talking to many associates out there, apparently, the message of Hesabika is not an easy one. That the message of Hesabika is too hard. In fact, I know that uh, is a case because one of the meetings that we had before this event was uh, a meeting of uh, uh, bank, uh, bankers, uh, economists, and uh, policy makers. One of the speakers here is uh, uh, Dr. Paul Mills, who is a senior economist with the uh, International Monetary Fund. He is here on a personal capacity. And uh, one of the meetings that he was going to address was for the bankers and the, and the economists. And uh, we, we had a very good meeting. But it was, it's, a, it's a difficult meeting because if you're talking about um, a, a case against a debt-based uh, growth strategy, uh, Kenya as an economy and our banks and financial institutions are so uh, heavily uh, leveraged uh, that the whole question of debt becomes a very sensitive one, even, even politically. But apparently, even for associates, the message of Esabika is not an easy one. And one of the things I, I, I heard from, from this person is uh, a response that apparently it is not realistic to expect that we, that we can be in the real world without a bribe here and a compromise there. So it means that even for us, Hesabika is a difficult message. And our prayer is that uh, those of us who are here are going to hear God afresh. And that God would give us um, a new perspective about what it is, what it means to be sought and light in his world. And maybe God wanted to teach us another lesson. Like, like Gideon uh, in chapter 7, verse 2. You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. And maybe God is saying that he doesn't need those numbers. And that the people that he really wants to speak to are the people who are here. And wouldn't it be wonderful, a wonderful thought, 
that years on, maybe five years on, maybe 10 years on, maybe 15 years on, we can look back and say, there is something God stirred in our hearts at uh, the Hesabika National Convention in 2016. And God has used that to begin or to continue a work of transformation that has changed Kenya and indeed the nations. Is that your prayer this morning? Buenas Fiwesana. A friend of uh, Focus and indeed uh, a friend of many of you, particularly those of uh, uh, my age and, uh, and older, uh, Uncle John Stott, who went to be with the Lord a number of years ago, uh, he kept, um, and um, it's from scripture, but he kept reminding us of um, um, in applying uh, what Jesus says, that you are the salt and light in the society. That when you enter a dark room, and of course it is dark, you don't blame the darkness. You don't ask, why is this place dark? Because you see, that is what happens when there is no light in a room. And when you taste tasteless food, you don't blame the food. That's what happens when there's no salt in the food. So when you see darkness in the society, and you see moral decay in the society. You don't blame the society. You don't blame the politicians, even Kenya politicians. You don't blame the lawyers and the policemen. You ask yourself, where is the light? Where is the sword? Where are the Christians? And so Hesabika, although we are going to talk a lot about the problems of out there and the issues that are happening in this nation, Actually, that's not what we really want to talk about. What we really want to talk about is that where is the light? Where is the sword? Where is the Christian? We want to point that finger at ourselves. That we all need to stand up and be counted. And that message is from the Lord Jesus himself. That you're going to be sought and light in his world. We seem to be very proud of our numbers as uh, Christians in this uh, land. We talk about uh, being 80% Christian. Uh, I'm sure we are not the ones who say that. Other people say that about uh, uh, Christianity in Africa and particularly in, uh, in Kenya. But maybe the very committed Christians, and I don't know how to measure that, uh, way fewer than that. Maybe, maybe 40%, maybe 30%. But the question is, how many people does it take to change the direction of a society? Sociologists argue about that. They talk about 3%, others 5%. But definitely you don't need 10%. You don't need 20%. You don't need the 30% that we could well be in this country of believers. So what's going wrong? In my introduction, I've quoted John Wesley, and uh, he's quoted to have said, give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I care not whether they be clergymen or laymen, they alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven upon earth. 100 to change the entire world. We are talking about Kenya, much smaller than the globe. That with 100 men and women, this country can be changed for God and for good. And the question that we need to answer each one of us by the end of this convention is that are we going to be part of that 100 or 200 that will be required to change the direction of this country. Buenas Fiosana. I finally just want to say a huge thank you to uh, everybody who has supported 
and encouraged us uh, along the way. Those who have supported uh, financially to um, Hesabika initiatives, you'll be acknowledging them in many ways, but you'll find uh, a list of them on uh, page eight of the handbook, and we want to say a huge uh, thank you uh, to them. Again, equally humbled by all our speakers, uh, plenary and the workshop presenters for availing yourself, and we look forward to a work of God amongst us uh, through you. And, um, um, and to all of you who have come, and we pray um, that uh, all of us, we hear God afresh, so that uh, we can be used as agents of uh, God's transformation for, for this land. To Hesabike, Vanas Viasana. Thank you so much, uh, Joshua. That was succinct to the point and encouraging all of us to make sure that at the end of the day, this really is about how we respond individually. Um, we may have safety in numbers, but at the end of the day, it's our actions individually that will count. We must stand and be counted. We do have Wi-Fi in the building, so if you do find a network that is named admin02, I'll ask uh, our sound team, media team, to put this on the screen. Admin02, the password is F-A, all in lowercase, F-A-C-E-D-E-A-F-2-5. If you could post that on the screen uh, in the course of the day. That's F-A-C-E-D-E-A-F-2-5, or face deaf 25 admin 2 We're now going to watch a video on the state of the nation, and after this short documentary, a group of students are going to share their response, led by our brother Ezekiel, their response to the state of our nation. So Kenya today remains deeply divided. We have a large youth population that doesn't seem to have values or right values because we have not exhibited those values that we all espouse. Well, I'm uh, concerned with the political climate at the moment, rather heated, and everybody is very concerned. Um, will this deteriorate? into the situation that we are in, in 2008, is that the way that it is going? The only key issue that if we sorted out, we'll sort out the other issues, is issues of uh, ethics and integrity, and the flip side of it is issues of corruption. The rate at which we are destroying our environment, the forest that we have, the water towers we have in this country is alarming. When I look at Kenya today, I see a country that's old in terms of we're over 50 years. We should be much further along the development line than we are. We should have made some bridges in terms of reducing the poverty levels, dealing with societal vices like corruption and division along ethnic lines, and the capacity for us to engage without resorting to violence and um, challenges on really how the whole societal system works. Uh, the society runs around trust. So without trust, nothing can move. So if that trust is, is breached, is abused, then it does not only result in corruption, but it destroys the, uh, the ethical and, and trust fabric of the society. You know, corruption affects our economy a big deal. Um, you know, this country loses a lot of money every year. Still, 30 percent, between 30 to 33 percent of the resources cannot be properly accounted for, which means that we are spending money, but we are not keen to show how we have spent that money. 
and a significant amount of that money goes to corruption or is wasted. So our young people now seem to think that corruption is fine as long as you don't get caught. The end result of this, of course, is that if we don't deal with it, it will destroy this country. And of course, a major concern is related to the elections next year. It's partly this. Will this election be peaceful? Will it be credible? Will it be free? Yeah, we are doing over 67% unemployment rate. The last figures do show that. We are also looking at global figures where we realize that 1% of fresh water is what is available for drinking today. The same is also coming back to Kenya and so many other issues because of pollution and so many other things that are affecting us. So only, you can imagine, only 1% of fresh water is what is readily available. The moment you live here, water is life. You must be able to save it. In the year 2009, when we did our last census, it showed that we have 8.7 million households in this country. 5.6 million households out of the 8.7 were using firewood for their household energy daily basis. Previously, we have been destroying 5.6 million trees every single day. Today it is more because the number of people has increased. The number of households has increased in our country. And therefore, if this is not alarming, that we are destroying over 5.6 million trees, three-year-old trees, every single day, I don't know if the church cannot wake up, who will wake up? And the key uh, issue of concern is that the Christian, who is supposed to be the salt and light, seems to have been sucked into this um, recurring cycle of issues and challenges and is not making a difference. So there's a new normal, even for the Christian, to just be part of the world. If you are really concerned, don't just talk, but see what action you can undertake. First, it is time for us to stand up individually and be counted. I believe that we must all wake up and stand to be counted. How are you? How are you, my friend? I'm doing good. Uh -huh. I'm doing fine. Uh -huh. Have a seat. Have a seat. Okay. Thank you. Ah. How have you been? I'm been good. You look so tired. Yes. Did you come by foot or? I started the journey at, at 12. 12? In the meantime. Uh. Hey. My son. Hey, hey, how are you? Hey, hey, is that a chopper? It's a chopper. Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? My brother. What? What? Why are you walking like that? The wallet. Hey. What do you mean? Hey. Welcome. Ah. <laughs> hey, boss, hey. hey, you guys, how are you doing? You're fine, fine, fine. fine. Yeah, a long time. Cool as always. Huh? Cool as always. And Voste, hey, what's happening? Hey, my guy, yeah? What's wrong, yeah? Uh, um, I had to dig for Mohogo for breakfast. Mohogo? Yeah, Mohogo. You, you are digging in the morning? Yeah, for People breakfast. Dig very, the, eh? very healthy, very healthy, very healthy. Dig. And there is bread and you are digging? We don't mm -hmm. eat bread, we don't ah, eat bread. Where are those things, Maintain your health, ah, maintain your health. My guy, eh? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Maintain your health. Ah, we told you these things. Where to look one beer, pesa, eco, kila, sa, eh? Ah, ah. Eish! 
Hey, hey. You remember how he me? Yeah, he me. Ah, yes. kijana when you are still very young and you are not digging in the morning, you are reading. Eh? Oh, no. okay. okay. Play that story down. But they must. Down. You have been read today. Why? Hey, you wouldn't want to imagine what I went through when I was coming here. Yeah. Tell us, tell us. Tell us. These policemen are just trouble. They stopped me for no mistake at all. They, they just told me to stop. Then, they tell me that for me to just continue with my journey, I need to pay a bribe. Yes, you pay them! Ati ni wapea kitu kidogo, mimi. Ata kwa chopa huko juwa natakanga kitu kidogo. And we give them, we give them bribes everywhere. Give no, them. no, no, this can't happen. I mean, there's no mistake I have made. I wasn't over speeding. Nothing was wrong. Why, 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 why would I pay a bribe? You, you didn't give them, you didn't give them a bribe. And I you refused. Wasted, and you wasted your time there. I refused. Yes. You know, you, you are that the is the right thing to do. Ah. No. Every time we say that time is more valuable than money, I'm, and now you cannot give your money to save your time. I'd huh? rather get late. What happened to you? I'd rather get late, but not pay a bribe. It ah. is not right. Ah. It is not right. Kwanza, no. Kwanza Where na, this country is getting rotten. Ah, ah. Sisi lipa bribe mimi. Kwanza na baadhi ya mitisho kitu kidogo. Sisi tunato wa kikubwa. And, and we still and give. When I say kitu kikubwa, and we give. You, you have been asked for kitu kidogo. Uh, yes, sorry, you know, at a common in my crocky dog or CSE Piana. This for real, man. Jodo, do you know I don't have employment because of one thing? Uh, you know, the job that you organized for me. Yes. So here I am taking myself with my CV, my 74 pages of CV, and here I am presenting them so confident. And then the manager tells me to give him 10,000. 10,000 10, 10, only, and you have 74 shilling of pages of CV, and you cannot give 10,000. Listen, ah. listen, ah. listen, Voste, Voste, you did the right thing. Thank you. You did the right no, thing. No, no. I am here, I have made it in life, but before I made it in life, mm. they, they, they also told me to do the same thing, that I should give some amount of money, and then the boss is also telling me to see him later. And, and you did not give them money? I did not give them. And how, how, how long? The Lord you... is faithful. And he how... saw me through. I tarmacked for four years, fine. But his reward is great. I came here driving, didn't I? Yeah. Uh, the Lord could have, uh, you know, the Lord could have answered your prayer earlier than the four years. If you just gave the bride. Yeah. No, no, no. Yes. I disagree. I yes. really, really disagree. <laughs> hey, Apana. Vosti, you did the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. You did the right thing. And uh, let me tell you one thing. He's going to reward you greatly. By the time you're getting your job, we will all be surprised. No more mhogo. Uh-uh, no more. You see, if, even God helps those who help themselves. The, which verse is that? God helps those who help themselves. I, 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 I have paraphrased it. I, I will which give you the verse. Which Bible do you read? The, the, the Bible that I read. But in Jodo version. Ah. Ah, there, there is that verse. God helps those who help themselves. And there is a soili saying, which hmm. says, Akili ni nyueli. Eh. Kila mtu anazake. No mwona misi janyoa. No mwona misi mwendo wazibu. So, that's why I took the shortcut. Mm -hmm. It was just simple. Just gave something small. And you see, you know these things. It happens. Eh. They are my business. Two know. years in time, I'm driving in my Range Rover. Sijaparara. Eh. I'm yeah. looking cool as always. You, you, God, God helps those who yeah, help, them. help themselves. We, 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 una, una na and then you, you can't even give 10,000. No, no, no. You see, you see, you see myself, eh? it was not me who came with the matatu. No, that was not me. Who, who was matatu, that? The driver, my, 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 the, the person who drives my car, uh, what wamta, they call him Adere. And you know, I am so rich, the, the person who opens my door, because my car is bigger, when I'm with a conda, conductor, you know, that person, <laughs> he's just my, my chauffeur, you know. Eh? I laugh, I'm so generous. My tattoo yangu, na bebo wa to 14. See, wana kujia na choba wana, me beba kunguni peke, I call you 14 people, man, eh? That's me. Oh, you surprise me, actually, uh -huh. for real. I don't know if you guys get it, how this effect of corruption is affecting our generation. 
It, our, our own generation, our young people, the generation to come. Talk of Likoni stuff. And you guys, it was all in the news. It was just a simple mistake which happened back door. And those kids have the lead. And this is endangering their lives. Okay, Judo, you have children, don't you? Huh? Of course, yes, you do. 17 of them. Okay, the number doesn't matter anyway, because I know who he is. But the point is, uh, these children, we are going to pass them through, through the back door. They are going to do medicine, any other cause, science stuff. And you know what will happen? They will commit the mistakes because they are not qualified. You will not only endanger them, but also your own family, the people you care the most. I, I don't know. Corruption is affecting us everywhere. Everywhere. People are dying because of this. You may not see it, but it's really, really happening. You know, and, you know the problem is, why are you looking at the people who are dying because of corruption, and there are people who are also living because of corruption? Uh, listen, you, listen, you, you, guys. You, 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 you guys are so one-sided. Uh, corruption is a two-headed coin, uh, not a two-headed. Uh, it, it's a coin. It has the good side and the bad side. Uh, those who are dying because of... I don't know if people are dying because of corruption, but there are those who are living because of corruption. So, let me tell you, Masi, yeah? You see, me, I deal with these tenders, eh? and as I told you last time, eh? you, you can't get a tender without giving something small to whoever is in charge. That's why we, we do these things. We, we, uh, let me not call it, you guys, are, you guys are calling appreciation a bad name, but appreciation is a bribe. No. Appreciation what? You appreciate the person who's giving you the tender, and you live well, eh? Listen, listen, let me give my story. I work on, at the city council in a row position that I cannot feed my family without bribes. So I wonder why you say that bribe is banned, corruption is banned. But I feed my family hey. just with the money I get from bribes from here and there. And, and you I'm feed in, the family? I'm deep in a system that I cannot change. Mm. Good, the good Look side at of me. the coin. Look at me. Yeah. I cannot change the whole city council. Yeah. But I'm, when I try to do it, I lose my job. What of my family, my kids. But how long will it take before the grass is cut off? Before that? The grass is cut off. It only flourishes for a moment. But the next moment, it's over. And the grass is normally cut, yes, yes. Yes, the grass is cut. I, I, I cannot understand. We, we cut the grass still, everywhere. You still water it. Jude, I, I still can't get you, my friend. You know, I still can't get you. Let me ask you this question. You all know about the golden bug scandal. You, you know that, eh? Mm -hmm. My brother, you know that, the golden bug scandal, you know? Mm -hmm. A golden so, bug. Ulipata pesa ngapi kutoka kwa scandal? My Range Rover, I think. So, you are one of them, so uh, no, uh, this no, will I be mean, taking you to court no, because you are one of them. How, how much did you get? Personally, I got nothing. But look at what I'm paying for. Me, I do not support the golden bag. What I support is you give Mukubwa something small, you get the job. Why are you bringing golden bag to Kitukidogo? It started from a step. That, 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 small that thing. compromise, that, that first compromise. compromise led to all those compromises. So it's a step that you have to take from a personal level, from a personal individual level. You have to yourself decide from within. So, Voste, you, what I, why are you saying corruption is bad, eh? Why am I seeing corruption is bad? Eh. My son, I think this. Just, just tell him because I think I, I can't do this anymore. Corruption is bad because it is. Because it is. Period. Ah, it is right. wrong. Period. How many people have had to suffer? Pieces of land have been grabbed everywhere. I mean, when, 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 when people are grabbing pieces of land, others suffer. They are being squatters because of that. Why corruption? How many people have come to an end because of this kitukidogo? It is wrong. And you being in those big offices, in your municipal hall, at your job, at your place of tenders, Jodo, at your business, you are the ones to make the change. I choose to be counted among those who will say no to corruption. I already am saying no. 
nimekataa kupatiana hongo nikikuja hapa you have to be that light you have to shine and say no to this whole thing because it's really bringing us to an untimely end definitely this world the problem of this world is not the absence of good people but the presence of good people who are not good for each other people who are bold enough to be coward to act in their own cowardice and stay in silence when they can spot the bad things happening in the society and they choose to keep quiet for tell me them. tell them go ahead for me i will stand for the truth i choose to be counted Eh? Have you chosen to be counted? Ati? Do you choose to be counted? You, you know guys, eh, hii hii kitu eh. Tu, Tumepatana tu hapa leo. Eh. Niombeni tu itakuwa sawa. Twende tutukule pale ka kitu lakini hii story tutaongea. Wewe host hata sasa kupea lift kwa chopa sasa wewe. Ah wewe. Ah wewe tembea tembea tu. Twende tukule. Na na wewe pia. Ah lakini hiyo story yenu. Ah I'll try I'll try. Amen. Thank you so much for that illustration. I'm still trying to wrap my head around how a policeman can stop you in a chopper in midair <laughs> to ask for a bribe, but uh, we will see. Amen. We want to welcome our national director George Ogallo to come and acknowledge uh, our guests. We have a number of distinguished guests who have joined us and we just want to recognize them. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. In a Hesabika convention, it's very challenging to categorize the guests. In fact, even if only the speakers came for Hesabika, there would be guests and delegates. Because the matter before us in Hesabika has all of us as guests. And so allow me to indulge and acknowledge a, a category of guests. And I want to begin with students being very special guests. Because the idea with Hesabika was to have associates to come together in a conversation. But from what students are presented here, Hesabika has to begin much earlier. So let me take this liberty to ask students who are in our presence, please. Don't just lift your hands, please stand up so that we can count you. All the students in our midst. Just keep standing, keep standing, keep standing. Thank you very much. These are not just future leaders, they are present leaders. You may be seated. Allow me to I uh, also appreciate uh, the workshop facilitators. You are here as a workshop facilitator. Please rise up on your feet so that we can acknowledge you. All those have been invited as workshop facilitators. Thank you. You may be seated. As I have mentioned, Hesabika is a double-edged sword. You give and you receive. And thank you very much for choosing to be, uh, be with us today uh, and be examples or other models of Hesabika. Allow me to acknowledge the presence of the FOCUS um, leadership. If you are in the advisory committee, you are in the, a, a member of the trustees board and the National Governing Council, please rise on your feet uh, so that we may appreciate you as well. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Uh, allow me to uh, appreciate those who are here, and you're here on your representing a, an organization. Perhaps some of them would be 
a number of them would be having exhibitions outside, but if you have come here representing an organization, uh, particularly, please rise up so that we can appreciate you. Thank you very much. This is a critical aspect of Hesabika because Hesabika is not just going to be synergy for individuals, but for organizations who are committed to uh, what Hesabika stands for. It may be difficult to, to determine this, but if you are here feeling that you are here for, for the sake of your county, uh, Kenya is now in a devolved system and county is significant even for Hesabika in the long run. So if you're here and you have a feeling that you are here for the sake of your county, please, we want to appreciate you. Thank you, Is Thank you, my sister. Devolution doesn't seem to be working. I thought uh, we would have a few more. I know that there are quite a number who, who also came, or rather maybe when we were thinking about you, it was also in relation to that kind of representation. I want to acknowledge um, also uh, the, the uh, people who are here on, um, on, uh, as representatives of the government. If you are here, could I ask you to stand on your feet uh, so that we can appreciate you. The government is a very complex one. Uh, somebody said that it's not easy to put face on the government. And as we are seated here, there are many ways in which we identify with that. But I want to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Samuel Kobia, uh, who is the senior advisor to the president on cohesion, peace, and national integration. And thank you so much for coming to stand with us uh, in Hesabika and to be part of it on your personal capacity as well. I want to acknowledge the presence of our, um, our, our plenary speakers. Uh, allow me to ask all the plenary speakers to stand so that we can appreciate you. The names are in the booklet and we'll keep hearing them, but please do stand on your feet so that we acknowledge, your, we acknowledge you. All the plenary speakers in our midst. Thank you very much and um, I would like to welcome special uh, guests who are either speakers in the plenary or speakers in um, the workshops. If you are a speaker and you, have, you are not a Kenyan, you have joined us from outside the country, even if you have stood, again, stood, uh, stood before, could you please rise again because you are very special guests in this particular forum. International uh, speakers. Thank you very much. You are such a great inspiration to us. Uh, I should not forget that if you are an international delegate and you are not a speaker, you are a delegate who has joined Hesabika and you are not a speaker, could you rise on your feet? I think Zimbabwe should be represented here, Uganda. Uh, could, we, could, we, could we have... Great, I can see some of them here. Thank you very much. Uh, you are very welcome. Uh, may the Lord bless us as we continue uh, to uh, reflect in this forum. And so there is rich symbolism here in the picture of the wilderness in the number 40. Not only is a new creation emerging, but perhaps a new Israel is to be formed. And it is there in the wilderness over those 40 days that Jesus is then tempted by the devil. Notice how the Spirit drives Jesus not into the place of security and comfort, which is what we often think the Holy Spirit is going to give us when he comes into our lives, but rather into the wilderness, into the face of spiritual evil there to be tested because unless our faith is tested we don't really know whether it is genuine or not and Jesus as one who identifies himself with Israel has to be also tested if Israel failed in the wilderness failed to live up to God's calling how is he going to deliver Israel if he cannot withstand the same testing? 
Now, there are a couple of things about these testings or temptations that we need to keep in mind. The first is that they are not just testings that Jesus experienced at the beginning of his public ministry, as if that was the only time he experienced temptations and then the rest of his ministry was temptation-free. No, these bring together the three commonest temptations that Jesus faced right throughout his ministry up until the crucifixion. And we'll see this as we go along. The second thing to note is that these are temptations that take place in the imagination. We are not to think of Jesus being physically carried by the devil to the top of a temple one moment and the next moment being found on the top of the highest mountain in Palestine. No, that is the world of fairy tales, of popular mythology. These are temptations that take place in his imagination because it is in our imagination that we experience temptation, don't we? And the battle against evil begins in our imagination. How we imagine our life, how we imagine success, how we imagine the world around us and our future, that is where we experience temptation. So let's look at these three temptations. Firstly, Jesus is hungry, and the devil says to him, well, if you're the son of God, and God has declared publicly at the River Jordan that you are his son, well, if you are his son, then why don't you satisfy your hunger? Use the powers that God has given you to turn these stones into bread. Why do you need to be hungry as a son of God? Notice that the devil is not questioning his sonship, but rather he's tempting Jesus to exploit his status as God's son to meet his own needs. Perhaps we should translate, since you're the son of God, why not turn these stones into bread? Now that's a very familiar temptation that we also face, isn't it? To think of all the powers, the abilities, the capacities that God has given us as being things that are given to satisfy ourselves, to meet our particular needs, to advance ourselves in society. Isn't that how most students are taught by their families and by the educational system? to think of their education, to think of our qualifications. They have now equipped me to climb up the social ladder. They are means to social mobility. So this is the first temptation. Is it self-advancement or self-gratification that Jesus is here for? Or is it to use his powers to serve others? The well-known German pastor and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was martyred by the Nazis in 1945, in his book Letters and Papers from Prison, which was the last book that he wrote, published after his death, he wrote, We have for once learnt to see the great events of history from the underside, from the perspective of the outcast, the maltreated, the powerless, the oppressed, the reviled. In short, from the perspective of those who suffer. We have for once learned to see the great events from the underside. Notice Bonhoeffer says this is a process of training, of learning. It doesn't come to us naturally to look at the world, to read history, and all that's happening around us from the perspective of the downtrodden, the powerless, the oppressed. That's not what the media or the education system encourages in us. The global media are obsessed with the rich nations, 
Even our local media pay more attention to the rich and the famous, celebrities, their lives. Rarely do we hear stories about what's happening in the lives of the poor, the downtrodden, the ethnically or religiously oppressed. But Christian discipleship is a process of being trained to look at ourselves and to look at the world from the perspective of the underside. Why? Because that is God's view of things. God doesn't look at our nations or look at ourselves from the top but from the bottom. And Christian discipleship is learning to develop that perspective. And like I said, to see even the gifts that God has given us as gifts that we are stewards of for the sake of those who are at the bottom, who don't have the privilege of the kind of education that you and I have had. I arrived yesterday in Nairobi, flying through uh, the Gulf states, Doha. I changed flights in Doha, Qatar. And you know that uh, these Gulf uh, cities like Dubai and Doha and Abu Dhabi are all competing with each other to have the tallest buildings in the world, the most magnificent um, supermarkets or shopping malls, the most lavish theme parks, uh, seven-star hotels which are palatial in their scale and grandeur. And so from the air, everything looks spectacular. It's like a little bit of Manhattan out in the desert. But then when you land and you live in these cities and you get to know the people, you realize that these are basically apartheid societies. And all these magnificent structures are built by people living under almost slave conditions. They're all migrant workers from the poorest countries of South and Southeast Asia. If you go into their dormitories, they are all overcrowded, unsanitary. And you know how cat eyes racing ahead to build all these football stadiums to host the World Cup in 2018. And there are literally thousands of these workers who have already perished putting up these football stadia because safety standards are violated. For a politician to be popular in Palestine, one had to hate the Romans. And Jesus refused to do this. In fact, he exalts a Roman soldier, a centurion, as a model of the kind of faith that God was looking for. What a countercultural, what an offensive thing to do in the face of Jewish nationalism. And then he goes and he parties with the tax collectors who are collecting taxes or customs duties for the Romans. He becomes friends of prostitutes and lepers, outsiders, people whom religious people would never associate with. Do you find pastors, folk or staff workers having friends amongst prostitutes and drug addicts in Nairobi? The people revere the temple and Jesus pronounces God's judgment on the temple. The people hate the Samaritans and Jesus mixes with them and he holds up one as an example of neighborly love in perhaps his most famous parable. So if the first temptation was about self-advancement or service to others, the second is about showmanship or integrity. And again, that's a very relevant choice today, isn't it? Because Evangelical Christian circles, especially in your part of the world and my part of the world, is riddled with showmanship. A lot of it coming from the American Bible Belt, but also our homegrown tele-evangelists, constantly promoting themselves. I was reading recently about a Russian philosopher, a woman called Tatiana Goricheva. During the years of Soviet communism, she was an outspoken critic of the Soviet regime. 
She was an atheist, but she also practiced yoga. And in her yoga class, she was given a book which contained various mantras or chants or sayings that people chant internally to focus their attention while practicing yoga. And she found that in this yoga book, one of the mantras or chants was what Christians call the Lord's Prayer. And she thought she would use this, even though she was an atheist. And as she automatically and without thinking kept chanting this prayer every morning in her yoga class, somehow it got under her skin. It changed her from within. She began to think about the words she was saying and it changed her outlook completely. And she became a Christian. Now she was given a choice by the Soviet regime, either imprisonment or to go into exile. And she went into exile in the United States. And there she encountered for the first time tele-evangelism. And she writes this in her book. She says, I saw my first religious broadcast on television and I'm so grateful to God that we have atheism and not religious education in the Soviet Union. Because what this man said on the screen was more likely to drive more people out of the church than all the clumsy chatter of our paid atheists. Dressed up in a posh way, this smug, slick preacher had to talk of love. But he was a boringly bad actor with mechanical and studied gestures. He was faceless. For the first time I understood how dangerous it is to talk about God. Each word must be a sacrifice, filled with authenticity. Otherwise, it's better to keep silent. Perhaps we need more silence in Kenya when it comes to talking about God. That's what Gauri Cheva would say. Let's get back to our text. Jesus is now in his imagination on a high mountain. And the devil is saying, well, if you will just bow down and worship me, all these kingdoms that you see before you will be yours. The devil has no authority to make this offer. He possesses nothing. He has no sovereignty over the nations unless the nations give it to him. It's uh, ironic because in Luke's gospel, in the opening chapters, we are told the kingdoms of the world come under the Roman Caesar. So is Matthew and Luke suggesting that actually behind the Roman Empire, there stands the activity of Satan? Anyway, what is interesting is that to possess the kingdoms of the world is precisely what Jesus has been anointed and commissioned by God for. The voice at his baptism has declared, you are my son, Psalm 2 verse 7. And the very next verse in Psalm 2 verse 8 says, ask of me and I will make the nations of the world your heritage. The ends of the earth will be your possession. So the goal is good that Jesus should have authority over the nations, that the nation should bow the knee and worship him alone. That is God's plan. That is God's purpose for Jesus and God's purpose for the world. But the question here is about whether the methods, the means that he is to use, also come from God. So this is the third temptation, whether the end justifies the means. You can have good ends, good goals, but what about the means we use to get there? Remember how at his trial, the high priest Caiaphas advised people, well, even if this man is innocent, 
It's better that he be put to death than the Romans come and destroy all of us. Now that is typical end justifying the means thinking. What does it matter if one innocent man is destroyed if we can save the whole nation? That's typical political thinking, isn't it? It's the thinking behind all terrorist groups, liberation movements, so-called. Well, let's sacrifice a few people so that our cause will be victorious. Governments think that way. What's wrong with torturing an innocent man if it will act as a deterrent to others? What does it matter if innocent Muslims are killed as long as we also get a few terrorists? And governments that end up using torture as routine practice end up becoming no different to the terrorists whom they are combating. You see, we are shaped by the means that we use. We see this in our places of work. I meet so many Christians who say, well, how can I expose these lies in my workplace? I will lose my job. So let me go along with the lies that are being told, say by an advertising company or an IT company that is being used by a corrupt and brutal regime. Oh, I won't speak out against corruption. I'll take this bribe. Why? Because one day I will become the CEO and then when I'm the CEO, I will change everything. I will now have the power to effect change. And then what happens is by the time you get your CEO, you've lost that vision of changing things and you have no credibility because people will say, you are no different to us. What authority do you have now to come and change things? We see this in economic life, don't you? I mean, the whole obsession with growing GNP or GDP as if that was the only index to a nation's uh, wealth and health. We never ask questions about the means that we use to grow our economies. A country can be manufacturing hard drugs and pornography and selling weapons and its GDP increases. Is that really a more developed, more civilized nation than others? What about if we are exploiting non-renewable mineral resources, energy resources, so although our economy is growing, we are leaving behind a, a deplenished world for our children and grandchildren. But we see this end justifying the means thinking also in our evangelism. There was a Singaporean church pastor who was in the news a couple of years ago. He was arrested by the police in Singapore because he used church funds in this mega church to finance his wife's singing career in, in California. And when he was questioned, he said, well, she's going to be using this money to promote the gospel, to sing gospel songs. And there were many people in his church who actually supported him, saying, yes, one can steal money so long as in the end, preaching the gospel is justified. It's very common practice in India and Sri Lanka for uh, Christian churches to invite children from the slums to come for English classes because there's a great hunger to learn English. And so Muslim and Hindu parents send their children to these churches to learn English and soon they find that they're being taught the Bible as the English textbook and they're horrified. And the churches say, well, what's wrong? We are converting these children. They're coming to know the Lord. And I ask them, well, would you like it if a uh, if a mosque were to offer classes in Arabic and then you find that people are being taught the Quran and encouraged to become Muslims. Also a lot of the so-called apologetic literature that we find especially coming from the USA tends to demonize Muslims or misrepresent or distort Islam. And I find a lot of Christian students using such literature. 
Can we actually deceive people by telling lies or half-truths about other faiths or about atheists and what atheists believe in the name of evangelism when we claim to be proclaiming truth? And it's little wonder when people who are brought up on this kind of literature, when they grow up and they meet really thoughtful, thinking, compassionate Muslims and Hindus, they think, well, the church doesn't understand, and they give up their faith altogether. And that is why if you want to learn about Islam, don't listen to a Christian talking about Islam. Find the best, the most articulate and the most devout Muslim in your neighborhood and ask him to come and teach your church or your Christian union all about Islam. That is showing integrity because that is the way we would like them to treat us. Because we know that when the typical Muslim preacher teaches his class in the mosque about Christianity, he will distort what Christians believe. Well, if we believe that about them, Aren't they also entitled, aren't they also right in thinking the same about us? And so much that is done in the name of evangelism actually is a denial of the very values of the gospel itself. Let me conclude. How does Jesus resist temptation? He hears a voice saying, you are my son, my beloved, in you is my delight. And then a few days later, he hears another voice saying, well, if you're the son, turn these stones into bread, leap from the temple, do something spectacular, impress the crowds, bow down and worship me and you will have the kingdoms of the world. How does Jesus discern which is the voice of God and which is the voice of God? Of the evil one. Remember I told you that the devil quoted scripture, but he quoted scripture out of context to use what many Christians today do and that is proof texting. Taking a verse out of its context in scripture, blowing it up and building a whole theology around it. That is how prosperity gospels come into being. Now if you go home and actually check the three times Jesus answers the devil, or answers himself, if you like, also quoting scripture. All those references that Jesus is using come from one section in the book of Deuteronomy, between Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Deuteronomy chapter 8. And those chapters are Moses' reminder to the people of their mission, of their vocation, he says, God has called you and formed you into a people, not because you are better than others, but because he wants you to be different to the nations. He's giving you these laws that if you practice these laws in the land, the neighboring nations will ask, who is this God who's given you such wise and just laws? And that is the way you bear witness to me. That is the way you become a light to the nations. Now we know that the tragedy of ancient Israel was that rather than being different to the nations and so being a light to them, they wanted to be just like the other nations. They adopted their gods and their laws and their political systems. And so they lost their mission, their vocation. They ceased to be the covenant people of God. So isn't it striking that Jesus is apparently meditating at the outset of his public ministry on the calling of Israel to be God's son. And Jesus is seeing himself in that biblical story, in that narrative, as the new Israel, or the true Israel, who will model for his people what it is to be God's son, how to live as God's son, and to take Israel's destiny upon himself, and so fulfill his calling. And so Jesus was willing to be counter-national, counter-cultural, 
to embody a different understanding of kingship and of sonship. He was a nonconformist. He was a disturber of the peace, as you read through his public ministry. He was not a nice guy seeking popularity from the crowds. Conformity may give you a quiet life. It may give you a university professorship or a vice chancellorship. It might get you into parliament so you can be a popular politician or even president or prime minister. But remember that all change in history, all progress has come from nonconformists. If there had been no troublemakers, no dissenters, no people willing to go against the herd, then all of us would still be living in caves. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Just in the quiet, may I invite you to respond to God in your hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Constancy to action. Constancy to action.